Welcome to the Landscape Photography Workshop. My name is Tim Shields and I am a landscape photographer and this is video number two of a three-part series. Now if you have not yet seen video number one, you're going to want to see that video before you watch this video because the skills I teach in video two build off of number one. So click the link up here, watch video number one. I'm not going anywhere. I'll be right here waiting for you after you finish. In video number one, we talked about the two fatal mistakes that will ruin your landscape photos and that are not recoverable from. And those two mistakes are making an error with your composition or making an error with your camera settings. There is a third step in creating photos and that's post-processing. But if you make a mistake in your post-processing, you can always go back and reprocess the photo because that photo is sitting on your hard drive. Not so with compositions or camera settings. So in this video, we're going to be taking a dive into camera settings and I'm going to be sharing with you some of my favorite camera settings that have helped me take award-winning photos. Now, at the very end of this video, I'm going to be showing you a photo that very well could be the best landscape photo I have ever taken. I took this photo two weeks ago, I'm very proud of it, and I have not yet made it public on the internet or on social media. You won't find it anywhere. I'm going to release it to you right here at the end of this video. When we talk about camera settings, you will often hear the term exposure triangle thrown around a lot. And the exposure triangle is a reference to the three most important settings on your camera, which are ISO, aperture, and shutter speed. But it starts to get very confusing and convoluted when we start discussing exposure triangle. So I have a different way that you can think about camera settings. You essentially have two goals when it comes to creating the settings on your camera. Goal number one is to have a sharp photo and goal number two is to have a correctly exposed photo. So let's talk about sharp photo. Now, when it comes to taking a sharp photo, there are three things that must come into alignment before your photo is going to be sharp. Yes, it's another list of three things. And those three things are shutter speed, depth of field, and focus. And I'm going to talk about focus here because it's such an important one. It's such a big one. Now, when you received your camera, either you bought it new from the factory or you bought it used, it comes automatically set for multi-point focus. And what that means is that when you lift up your camera and you push that shutter button halfway down, your camera is sampling the entire scene and it's looking at for example, if you were taking a photo of me right now, it would be looking at me, it would be looking at the computer monitor beside me, the old camera that's sitting there, and it would be making a decision on what the camera should actually focus on. But in landscape photography, we don't want our camera making that decision on our behalf. We need to take control of the focus point and tell that camera, instruct it, what needs to be in sharp focus in the frame and especially in between foreground and background. And for that reason, I always turn off multi-point focus unless I'm taking tourist snapshots or like a birthday party type photos at home. When it comes to landscape photography, I always have my camera on single point focus. And there's a general rule that is tried and true. It's, it's very simplistic. But generally in landscape photos, if you set your single point focus on a point that is about one third into the scene, so one third in between the foreground and the background, then nine times out of 10, you're going to have a sharp photo. Now the second essential component to your camera settings when you're taking landscape photos is ensuring that your photo is correctly exposed. And this is a reference to light. Now, as a landscape photographer, you do not have any control over the lighting in the overall scene where you're standing. It's very different than studio photography. In studio photography, the photographer is using either video lights or flash strobe type lights to control the light. And so in studio photography, I'm going to be so bold as to say, it is much more easy to create a correctly exposed photo when you are in the studio and you control the light compared with when you are out in the field 
and it is Mother Nature who is controlling the light. And for this reason, you have to ensure that you are not blowing out the highlights in the sky. This is the number one mistake that landscape photographers make, and I see it all the time with my photography students. It's blown out highlights in the sky. Now, what do I mean by that? The sky is the brightest component of any landscape photo, and you need to ensure that the details in the sky can still be visible after that photo has been taken. And if the highlights are too bright, in the sky. That means that you will not be able to recover those details in post-processing later on. It essentially means that you have made a fatal mistake and those highlights from the sky or in the bright parts of your photo, maybe the reflection off of water, they cannot be recovered. So how do we ensure that we don't blow out the highlights in any landscape photo? We use the histogram. And what I have learned through my landscape photography and what I teach to my students is that you need to get to the point where the histogram becomes your best friend. I consider the histogram to be equally as important as choosing a composition or ensuring that my image is in focus. The histogram is vitally essential to ensuring that I have a correctly exposed photo. Now let me tell you a story about this photo that I took a couple of weeks ago that is certainly the photo of the year for me and maybe even the photo of my life. So I was on a landscape photography trip with my wife and we were in the lavender fields of France. I was looking forward to taking a beautiful sunset photo with the nice rose of lavender and I had found a composition where there was a single tree on the horizon and I was pretty happy about finding that spot. On the afternoon of the photo shoot, the blue sky started to disappear and some angry clouds started moving in and I could see on the horizon that there were streaks of rain in the distance and I was thinking, uh-oh, this isn't good for my beautiful sunset shot that I'm hoping to get tonight. So sure enough, the rain started to fall and we were driving in the car on our way to the photography location that was about half an hour away and the rain came down in sheets. It was going across the road. It was coming down roadways in small rivers. I mean, it was pouring rain. Here we are in a real rainstorm and there's lightning. Sunset isn't for another three full hours and yet it's practically dark here, it seems like. So it's not looking overly promising for this last photo shoot of the trip, but things change fast, right? So. We just got to get in position and hope that the weather is going to change. By the time we got out to that lavender field, I was thinking to myself that the photo opportunity is over. I'm not going to get my sunset. I'm not going to get that nice warm orangey light coming across the rows of lavender. But we went out into the field and got set up anyway. So when we arrived at the one lone tree in the lavender field, the sky was an angry jumble of dark and dark blue clouds and the rain had stopped fortunately and I set up my camera and I was just waiting for the light to change. I was hoping that there would be an opening in the clouds and that the sun would come through. I was going to be able to get that sunset shot that I really wanted but it didn't happen. And what I saw was actually the opposite. I started to see lightning and I could hear thunder. And I was thinking, oh no, this is terrible. Uh, I came here for a sunset photo and the sky is not cooperating. It's not giving me what I wanted. And there was some more lightning. And then I thought to myself, wait a minute, I'm missing out on a really big opportunity here. I had the mindset of a one track mind. I was only focusing on the photo that I wanted to get instead of adapting and changing to the changing weather conditions. And when I saw that lightning going off numerous times, I started to think, maybe I can capture this lightning. But how do you capture lightning with a camera? When you have a fast shutter speed and you just go click, it's much too fast. You're never going to be able to capture lightning unless you have a specialized electronic device that sees the flash and then remotely uh, sets off the shutter. I didn't have that. So I thought to myself, okay, maybe I can actually capture something really beautiful here. So I closed down the aperture so it was a high f-stop number. 
I set the ISO to the lowest number on my camera and because of those two settings that allowed me to extend the shutter speed out to five seconds long. Of course the camera was on a tripod, I had a wired remote shutter and I started to take five second long photos. So I would click the shutter and then the five seconds would elapse uh, the shutter would close and I would click it again right away and I would click it again and again just hoping that the lightning would go off again while the shutter was actually open. I probably did this 150 times, I'm not kidding. And finally on the 151st time there was a gigantic flash of light and a loud almost deafening thunderclap and there were four streaks of lightning that came from the sky down to the ground on either side of the tree that I had centered in my frame. And as soon as that happened, like within one second after that, the shutter closed and I thought to myself, please tell me I just got this. So I walked over to the camera. Okay, I was already at the camera. So I reviewed the photo and sure enough, there were the lightning bolts right in the photo. I literally jumped for joy. I mean, I was yelling. I was so excited that I had got this photo. It was like the photo of a lifetime for me as a landscape photographer. And it's something that I'm definitely proud of. So you're going to see it right now for the very first time. Here's the photo that I took on that day. And the only reason that I was able to take it was because I changed my mindset and adapted to those changing weather conditions that changing weather and angry weather often make for the absolute best landscape photos. Now, I'm going to ask you, what is your dream type of photo? What photo do you dream of taking? Is it a, a photo like this one with lightning? Is it a sunset? Is it a portrait or a studio type of shot? Leave a comment below, please. I would really appreciate it if you would. And tell me what is your dream photo that you would love to take the most. In the next video, video number three, I'm going to be showing you how you can take your photography to the next level and how you can take the photo of your dreams. So watch your email. I will be making the announcement about video number three very, very soon. I hope you enjoyed this and please do leave a comment below. I'll see you in video number three.